For those who prefer Linux or are simply curious about Linux and other open source technologies, this is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to episode number 281 of Category 5 Technology TV. It's February 4th, Yay. 2013. No, it's the 5th. It's the 5th. It is the 5th. Yeah. <laughs> I am Fast stuck forward to the future. It's February 5th. Yeah. yeah. How are you? Sasha Lee Dermatis. Yes. How are you? Great. How are you? Good, good. Excellent. Yeah, hey, everybody. Show, everybody. Yeah. Nice to be back. How are you guys doing? Nice to see you in the chat room. Unfortunately, uh, tonight we are unable to launch Hangouts. Uh, we were hoping to be broadcasting live on YouTube. Tonight, uh, unfortunately, is not a go. So if you uh, depend on Hangouts, uh, make sure you tune in again next week. But this episode is available through our website and, of course, uh, will be available on YouTube after the fact as well. So <laughs> we've got some exciting stuff going on tonight. Now. We're going to be talking about chocolate. We're going to be talking about all different... Uh, tech stuff. So if you've got anybody around that uh, is not familiar with how to use the internet, things like that, um, you, you want to make sure that you tune into the show tonight. Um, gather them around the computer, around mm-hmm. the TV, around the Roku box, the <laughs> Miro Internet TV, the uh, First Run TV, whatever you're watching the show on. Just hop Everybody around. with the iPhone, you know. Just, oh, yeah. just that's sit, right. You know, maybe maybe Excellent. one of the kids can hold the iPhone in front and you can all watch it together. That'd be That'd be nice. Excellent. Now, we have some stuff coming up in the newsroom. Mm. We have um, Amazon is launching its own virtual currency. Neat. Very cool. 250,000 Twitter users' info info and passwords have been stolen by hackers. Not so neat. Um, Dyson has unveiled a water tap which contains a built-in hand dryer. Sounds handy. (laughs) But, um, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sony is ending production of their mini disc stereos. And to that we say, oh, were what? they still making those? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh, we'll have a talk I about mini discs in a little while. I didn't even have a clue they ever existed, to be honest really? with you. Okay. So there you go. I was in radio, so I know. And now they've stopped. Mm. Design plans for 3D printed buildings on the moon have been revealed. Stick buildings up. now. Buildings on the moon. Nice. Very nice buildings. Stick around. These stories are coming up later in the show. Excellent. Oh, no. Have you seen that error message today? Couldn't load plug-in Linux users. I know it's dim, but there it is. If you're seeing that tonight, there was a problem in uh, Google Chrome tonight. Today, yesterday, it kind of kicked in, but they had a, an issue where Flash, they've started integrating Flash directly into the browser. So you don't have to install Flash oh, okay. separately. But it's not really flash per se it's this pepper flash so it's been causing all kinds of havoc for linux users all around the world so if you use chrome and you're having that problem i'll show you how to really really quickly fix that so uh, those in the chat room if anyone shows up and says yeah pepper's not working uh they won't say that they'll be like why isn't (laughs) why isn't chrome working why can't i watch a show why can't i get on youtube why can't i access things i was trying to listen to music today uh through chrome i go to shoutcast.com and i clicked on one of the stations and of course it uses flash at the bottom of the the window to to actually play the audio Mm -hmm. and it wasn't working it was giving some kind of weird weird errors and things even different from the one that i just showed you there Uh, so all you have to do is just you know what you can just get into uh your your like computer Hit control L and go slash dot config. And in your config folder, this is dot config in the home folder of your user, you're gonna see one called Google Chrome. So Linux users, if you if you're using Chrome and you can't get Flash working, 
this is what you want to do. Get in there and you see this folder now called Pepper Flash. You'll see that I've got zero items in it now. It is just a folder and all you have to do is right click on it and go move to trash, delete it, and then Flash is going to be working again for you. Simple. Easy breezy. Easy. Yeah. Delete. I can do that. So, yeah, <laughs> delete. <laughs> oh no, where'd it go? I feel a story there. <laughs> uh, Keeping your backups? Excellent. All right. Later in the show. Yes. Don't forget about our mobile site, m.cat5.tv. Check it out. Scan that QR code with that device. It's a little awkward, I know, because Billy's holding it and everyone's sitting around. But uh, make sure you scan that. Get over to m.cat5.tv to, uh, to watch the show. You can catch it live with many mobile devices. So if you're sitting in the car and you can't make it home in time to pop the popcorn and, and watch the show live, you can actually pick it up through your, uh, your iPhone or your Android device. Which is how I always watch it. Yeah? Yeah. There to you be go. honest, there you have Very it. Good. Except when I'm on. Yes. <laughs> We've had that discussion, but that's really awkward. It's like, Sasha. <laughs> Look at me. Pay okay. attention. She answers everything three seconds late because there's a delay. <laughs> <laughs> so smart. Yeah. All right. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. And the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Sasha, I saw you've got a postcard here. Sure what do. What do we have? From the Barbados. From the Barbados. Beautiful. Hey, everybody. Here we go. Dear Robbie, thank you for your help with choosing an e-reader. We are very pleased to have attended your fifth anniversary, and we are one of the lucky ones to win a prize. Great, warm, sunny weather here in Barbados. Come to visit us soon. Cheers Brilliant. from Isabel and John who obviously live in Barbados and came all the way here for the fifth anniversary show. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So I think that I should just go visit them. Now, now that I know, I'm <laughs> glad they won a prize. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sent them away with something great, I'm sure. Beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the postcard. Thanks for watching the show. Nice to have you uh, joining us at our fifth anniversary here in Barrie as well. And uh, hope you enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now. Um, and did, what was the was that like a hint to an invitation? Come and visit us soon. That is exactly it. Very well. If you would like to invite us anywhere, send us a postcard. Let the tour begin. Exactly. Send us a postcard, return address, and uh, <laughs> we'll send something back by way of us. That's right. Oh, you live in Barbados? Or Jamaica? Robbie's at the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere at all. We were talking Excellent. about Dominican Republic last week. That would be all right, too. I could handle I, that. Handle it. Yeah. Aus Australia would be... Ecuador would be good. Yeah. New Zealand. Even uh, the, the UK. I'd love to go to the UK. That'd be fantastic. Uh, yeah. The Netherlands. Go see some of our friends in the Netherlands. I also would like to visit some of Canada, to be honest. Yes. Newfoundland would be Speak good. Land. Yeah. yeah. Invite me there. I'd love to go to <laughs> Newfoundland. Um, I've heard... I found a station. I was flipping through, mm -hmm. and I found a station that was playing a bunch of music from Newfoundland, and it was... Like, it's, it sounded very Celtic. I was surprised. Like it sounded like something from Ireland or something. Yeah, they're know. very, I think they're very Celtically influenced, yeah. except their screech, which comes from Jamaica. Their screech. Yeah, I their rum. The screech. The, to get screeched in in Newfoundland, it's Jamaican rum, turns out. Oh, it's a drink. It is. Okay, very yeah, well. And you ki kiss a fish. <laughs> anyway. I was, I was literally, when I was talking <laughs> about music, I was picturing them like actually screeching. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's very Celtic. I, they didn't play that on that particular <laughs> radio station. But um, hey, you can send in your postcard and we'd love to receive it. Make sure you put your re return address so we can come pay you a visit. Uh, put us up for the night. Category 5 Technology TV. You can send that to P.O. Box 29009, Barrie, Ontario, Canada, L4N7W7. Very good. Well, hey, we've got an excellent show coming up for you. Uh, and uh, stick around. We're going to have, just after the break, we're going to have Belgian chocolate uh, or master chocolatier, I should mm -hmm. say. Kevin Richards is joining us from Theobroma. And uh, we're going to be talking about how he's able to use some pretty cool ways of using technology, uh, even within chocolate making. And really, that's just an excuse to get him on the show and get him to bring us some chocolate. Yeah. Truth be told. Here we go. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> we'll be right back. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. 
Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com We're joined tonight by Kevin Richards. He's the Belgian master chocolatier uh, from Theobroma. And uh, Kevin, it's, it's great to have you here on the show. Thanks Thank for you for the in. invitation. This yeah. is a big honor to be a part of this. This is, uh, this is really fascinating. It's a neat place, eh? It's amazing. Lots of fun. I, I love the sign. Congratulations on that. That's yeah. very cool. Cheers. Yeah, the yeah. sign was uh, donated this week. So I've gotten quite cool. the uh, techie education over the last few days since uh, you and I have met. Yeah. Uh, checking out your website. You've got some pretty amazing guests as well, too. You've got a pretty good history. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Um, I wanted to have you on the show and kind of talk a little bit about, you know, obviously Valentine's Day is coming up. So yep. you know, people are saying, well, what's, what's, you know, this is a tech show. We've got chocolate coming on. Well, guys, ladies, leave the room because the guys need to hear me right now. So give me just a second. <laughs> guys, Valentine's Day is coming up. We've got an opportunity to get mm-hmm. you here some very, very fine chocolate for the ladies. Yeah. All right. So if you want to get in their good books, this is what you need to do. You need to listen up. We're going to have a little chat here, Kevin and I. Absolutely. We're going to have a little taste test. Sasha's going to be our guinea pig. We're going to see how much the ladies are going to love this. And uh, and we can possibly send out some chocolates as well. Absolutely. So absolutely. Just in time for Valentine's Day. All right, Big lady, day. cha-ching. Call the ladies back in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what you know, Theobroma is uh, is your company. It is. And you are a Belgian master chocolatier, which that's correct. I'm no chocolate guru okay but i i mean i've heard the phrase and that to me is that's a prestigious it is a pretty big deal there's very few of them um you have to go through an actual chocolatier certification to actually graduate from that which i graduated with honors from that course and mm-hmm. then was allowed to then go to the next level where i studied in alst in belgium and uh spent a week in alst with uh, other grandmaster chocolatiers and it was just absolutely amazing the things mm-hmm. we learned how to do sculptures and how to make pralines and it was it was pretty impressive cool. it was a lot of chocolate yeah still didn't <laughs> no get chocolate it out yeah, no, you, yeah, there's Never. no such thing, no such thing. <laughs> um, what, what kind of makes your chocolates different? I mean, I, I've, I've tasted them. I know it's exceptional stuff. It's, it's, like, it's unlike anything that you've ever had before. Um, okay. What is it about your chocolate that really makes that happen? Is well, that working for me? It is working for me. Yeah. The, the funny <laughs> thing is, is when people say chocolate is Belgian, it's actually processed in Belgium. It, there's French chocolate, there's Swiss chocolate. None of the cocoa ever really originates in Belgium. So it actually mm-hmm. will start in either the Amazon rainforest, where I get my chocolate, which yeah. is where the 0.1% of the world's finest actually originates. Then there's the Ivory Coast, which is now producing about 80% of the world's cocoa. Um, and that cocoa, I don't know if you've ever had maybe a Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee and tried to compare it to maybe a Kenyan roast. You know, an African sort of coffee is very similar to an African cocoa. It's very bitter. It's very strong. It's very... It almost tastes burnt. It's got a very bark sort of taste, whereas something from South America is far more floral, fruity, nutty. It's far more complex. Mm. You can uh, see it in the beans and the pods. Those are Venezuelan cocoa beans. Um, That's actually a cacao pod and cacao beans. Inside that pod, you'll uh, find about 20 to 30 of those beans. They actually then go to... um, My cocoa doesn't go to Belgium. It actually goes to France. Um, Mostly because Belgium is now processing mostly uh, West African cocoa. Hmm. Um, so some of the bigger name companies, as well as some of the people who only make brownies and cupcakes, are using the same cocoa. So right. to say you're a Belgian chocolatier, I'm using Belgian technique that I learned there. Right. But I didn't bring any of the Belgian chocolate home with me. I actually choose a finer chocolate that gets processed for me in, in uh, France and then sent back to me as what's called a Calais or as a cocoa powder. Very nice. And I understand that everything, correct me if I'm mistaken, but everything is done by hand. Everything I'm doing is completely by hand. Even the uh, doing is not by hand is the melting of the chocolate. That's sure. <laughs> that's in the tempering pot there. But I do hand make everything. I hand make my own caramel. It's my own recipes. Um, everything I do is right from scratch. It's been my own invention, and I uh, dip it all by hand. All created by me. And that makes me think about you know what what's different about the taste of the chocolate. Uh, where do you get your recipes, and where does that kind of it took me almost six months to actually get my caramel recipe where I wanted it. When I first started making caramel, my fiance is a, a chocolate junkie. I'd like to call her a chocolate Perfect. junkie. More of, a, more of a caramel Tester. junkie. Yeah, I've got a treadmill sitting in front of the chocolate area where she's <laughs> trying things. So when she tried my first couple batches of caramel, she would say, it's too salty, it's too this, it's too that. And then I've tried oh, to gotcha. educate her a bit on mm-hmm. her palate and saying yep. something might seem salty, 
or something that might t- seem sweet. A lot of people say, oh, I don't like that chocolate. It makes me thirsty. It's too salty. Oh. Well, if you're saying it's salty, that's great. A lot of people say it's the sugar. It's not the sugar. It is the salt. It's the butter a lot of the time in some of the fats or some of the things that you make, like caramel, that actually make you thirsty. Interesting. Yeah, there's a real process to getting your palate to do what you want. I do a uh, an Inniskillen Cabernet Franc ice wine truffle, and I actually tasted over 40 different brands of ice wine to narrow it down to the uh, the ice wine that I chose really? for the perfect pairing. Because some wow. of them were just too too fruity, more of a melon, more of a more of a floral taste, yep. and I had to really narrow it down. A lot of time. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> a lot of time drinking it, ice it sound, wine. It, was it sounds hell. to me like it's a it's a bit of there's a bit of a almost a chemistry involved, and I, I've seen Absolutely. you set up, and it's very much, you know, it feels it's pristine, but very much like you've you've meticulously planned yeah. out the, each recipe. Well, um, when I was in Belgium, one of the places we went to, this guy named Chef Vart, who is considered the world's most uh, sensitive palate uh, when it <laughs> comes to chocolate, he said that he went to a place in Ethiopia to go and check out certain um, spices and one of the spices he was checking out there I forget which one it was but he said that there was over 400 different variances of this one spice and he tried them all to narrow it down to the one he uses in his really? truffle so and he could actually discern he actually could and it's funny because we went through a tasting test with him where we were tasting different things and he had about 40 different kinds of 40 50 different kinds of cinnamon Wow. And I was like, okay, cinnamon, cinnamon, really? There's what one cinnamon, the cinnamon you stir in your apple cider. Like, what sure. else is there? Yeah. And we got to really expand on it. And we, some of it tastes more like bacon than it did cinnamon. Like, it wasn't even, it didn't even <laughs> well, taste like cinnamon. bring on the bacon spice. Chocolate dipped bacon is really good, Swell. too, by the way. But. <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so I, I, I mentioned that I'd like to talk a little bit about the technology yeah, and the technique. Sure. Now, you are making all these truffles and chocolates mm-hmm. by hand. Yep. But there are some intriguing ways that you're using almost consumer-like technologies in order to take things to the next level. I think about the way that you're, you're doing designs and things. Yep. If you could uh, let us know a little bit about that, I'll, you know well, about the process. You, you shared a little bit about it with me, and I was a little surprised that there's a, a technology behind it's pretty neat. how you're doing it. Yeah. Well, even simple things like printing. Mm-hmm. One of the things I've managed to really get my grasp on has been doing things for um, different marketing, different sort of levels for things, um, as opposed to just social media and trying to promote it that way. Sure. Um, it's been a very big deal for corporate people and weddings to get you know an image, and definitely people are working on their brand. Yeah. And one of the things that I've been able to do is to actually have a cocoa butter transfer that I now print through a little Epson or a bubble jet printer, and we actually print onto a transfer sheet and on that transfer sheet, you can use an edible, well, some people use an edible ink like they do on uh, birthday cakes. You've seen people put somebody's yeah. face on a birthday cake, for example. That's an edible ink. It's a vegetable-based ink. Mine is actually made with a cocoa butter. We've got six different wow. colors, and it goes through the Lepson printer. So I could do a full-color printer uh, picture of anybody's corporate logo, whether it was Facebook really? or Category 5, That's and put it onto a, onto a truffle. If somebody's getting married, I could put Kevin and Janine around it. I could do a... You could print my head onto a perfectly round truffle. On a, I could make your head perfectly round, just like that. It, it would and shine it up. And make sure we shine it up. It'd be beautiful. Sounds great. Uh, so these are actually printer cartridges that are going into a yeah. printer. Yeah. That are printing using cocoa butter instead of ink. Yeah, and it's it doesn't taste like anything. It doesn't have because cocoa butter is very, very tasteless. It's not like a regular cocoa. Um, yeah. It's not going to have a, a strong um, hint of anything. It's just very. It's, and it's not going to be invasive in any way with the rest of the truffle, so it's not going to affect the character or the taste of the truffle. Sure, yeah. You were mentioning how some sometimes garnishes and things, like white chocolate garnishes, yeah. that can throw off the, the People taste. People making the their truffle. truffles trying to be pretty, and that's one of the things that just makes me crazy, is my truffles don't necessarily look the prettiest. They've got a nice shine. They've gone through what we call tempering, which is kind of the most overused word in the chocolate world. It's actually got to do with crystallization. But when it goes through the tempering, um, people will then all of a sudden decorate their pretty truffle with white chocolate. So you've made this beautiful dark chocolate creation, paired it perfectly with a nice ice wine. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you decorate it with what? You've got white chocolate in there <laughs> and milk chocolate. Well, didn't you just spend that amount of time pairing it to taste great? And now the right. first thing you taste is throwing it off. Right. It's like people who put the salt of a chocolate for my caramel, for example. I do a, a wonderful caramel and sea salt truffle. Mm-hmm. Well, my sea salt is on the inside, on the bottom. So it's the last thing that you taste. So it doesn't. Oh so it gosh, balances okay. it off, right? Yeah. It's got a nice finish. Yeah. You put the sea salt on the outside, like some people do as a decoration. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the first the thing salt. you taste. Yeah. 
However, I'm doing a, tr a truffle that'll come out not this year, but next year for Cinco de Mayo, mm -hmm. which has actually got Jose Cuervo gold mixed with a milk chocolate center with a small piece of lime in the center dipped in dark chocolate with a little bit of salt on the outside. And the reason for that is lick, guys hear shoot, this? suck. So you've got nice. your salt, chocolate with the tequila, and then the lime all one after another. Cinco de Mayo. Sounds like a tough job. Yeah. A real tough job. Yeah. Small amounts of the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but loads and loads of chocolates. Folks. Lots of chocolate, because it's good for you. <laughs> so we, we want to be able to get our viewers a pack of these chocolates. These yep. are Fiabroma fine gourmet chocolate truffles. I mean, just awesome stuff. What do you have available right now? Right now, I'll give you a quick rundown of some of my favorite ones. My my favorite is always going to be my Inniskillen Cabernet Franc ice wine. I just love that. It's, it's wonderful. It's got a nice finish. My fiance, Janine, just loves her caramel and sea salt. It's all day long. It's her favorite. Um, my kids love my organic peanut butter truffle, which is... Um, it's what peanut butter is supposed to taste like. It's a real peanut butter. It's not like that processed sort of plasticky peanut-y sure. uh, commercial chocolate. It's a wonderful peanut butter. Um, and we make our own peanut butter with, uh, and we mix it up with the proper oil. So it's it's a wonderful, nice finish on that. Um, my newest creation that I've really had a lot of fun with is my peanut butter, or sorry, my uh, root beer and vanilla, where we actually extract the, um, the root beer from a sarsaparilla root and combine it with Madagascar vanilla. That we extract really? from Madagascar. Vanilla so you're getting root. that root beer taste from the root. It tastes like a root beer yeah. truffle or like a root beer flow with right. chocolate. But completely non-synthetic. Completely real. Do you it's use wonderful. preservatives in your truffles? Zero. And that's why the shelf life on my chocolates, I haven't really been able to test it as long as I'd like because I've never had chocolate sit on a shelf for more than a few <laughs> days. So we actually had to make a couple of pots of chocolate and put them aside in little bowls and, and put them all away and say, okay, we're going to try this one every Friday, and we're going to come back and keep trying it. Right. There was zero discoloration and zero um, fade in, in flavor in, in any of the chocolates until almost the two-month mark. So we've been pretty lucky. Wow, very good. Yeah. Cat5.tv slash yum. <laughs> Head on over there, cat5.tv slash yum. Check them out. That's Theobroma uh, Chocolates. And we're actually going to be giving away a box of these chocolates. So yeah. anywhere you are, make sure. Here's, here's what you need to do. So TV, I'm gonna, I'm gonna taste start. vision. That's what oh, we yeah. need to do. Because I want, I want you to try this, folks. But, I mean, get on there. Make sure you order them before before Valentine's Day. Get them in time. Uh, what I want you to do is get onto that website, cat5.tv slash yum. And on the website is the definition, uh, or at least the, the re reason that you chose the word theobroma. Yeah for your company so mm -hmm. uh and, am i saying that right is it you are saying it perfectly theobroma. fantastic oh, you know nice. excellent so find out what theobroma means according to that website at cat5.tv slash yum and uh email me live at category5.tv we're gonna give them a week to yep. uh to get those in uh so that those of you who are watching this after the fact if you're watching on firstrun.tv or if you're watching on miro internet tv or youtube uh you still have a chance to participate in the contest as well if you weren't watching live uh, so get that to me. We're going to have a draw during uh, episode number 282, and uh, and we'll be sending you out that box of chocolates. Yeah, my so. compliments. Let's take a look at the box itself. Perfect. Um, now, I saw you actually, you even package these things up by hand. I do. Well, you actually got that up on your screen, which is great, so I don't have to show it off. <laughs> the, uh, the boxes I actually had designed, and it was, I couldn't believe how quickly we managed to put this box together. When I first started looking at the, the packaging end of it, yeah. um, it was it was a pain because I, I had the exact image of, in my head of what I wanted. I had contacted a place in the United States. They told me I could have the box for about $6 a box. Yikes. And I was like, $6 to make me a box? I go, how old am I going to have that as a markup on my chocolate? That's yeah, almost yeah, as much yeah. as the chocolate was. Contacted a place in Canada, which, you know, you know I want to shop local. I want to buy yeah, local. Yeah, as best you can. It sure. was just a little over $8 finished to my door per box for a four-pack of chocolates. Yikes. Contacted a place in China. I sent them a sketch, a sketch, and then I had all the AI format and everything else of the actual artwork that I had um, my cousin actually do for me. I drew it all up, and he, did, he nailed it. Sent it off to them. He told them where to hit it with the lacquer and blah, blah, blah with the shine. And three to six weeks later, somewhere around there, I had the box in my hands finished. It, it was exactly what I wanted, exactly to the to the perfect they and look fantastic i mean that's beautiful they and they knew nice to job. do food safe ink there was no technical sure. anything they just sent it back the only thing i ever added was the website to the back of the box yeah and that was it very good that's oh, lovely and the chocolates are made right here in barry ontario right inside there is this is a four pack of the oops the ice wine chocolates inside here you get a little insert of where the card of where the uh, chocolate comes from and how to eat it i just realized that you're like a magician there 
Do you like he that? He dropped one and he just... <laughs> I just oh, it's okay. I got another one here. Can you pull out a bird? <laughs> Wait, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we need to try these. Yep. I think we've got time before the news. What do you think, Sasha? Is that? I Sasha's that? pretty all right with that. So what, what do you recommend that Sasha... Well, they're all the same in these here. boxes right now. Okay, I didn't bring are, any of the other the fancier ones, ones today. It's a good way to... Um, I am in my milk chocolate production today. Okay. You're going to so, have to... Just come yeah. Oops. All right. There we go. So, Sasha, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> There is. She's begging you for this chocolate right now. <laughs> Beg me. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. This is the ice wine truffle. So you can unwrap it. To really appreciate a truffle, you should take a look at it. Actually, undress the truffle here. Smell the truffle. You can actually taste, taste it through your nose. You can actually get a chocolate hint into your mouth just through your nose if you do it properly. Hopefully you're not congested. <laughs> you then throw the whole truffle into your mouth. The ice wine will help with that. Yeah. By the, way. the difference between a truffle and something like a praline, the praline, the North American version, the praline is they're layered. Yeah. So you can bite those because they're going to have the layers going this way. A truffle, for example, you create what's called a ganache. So you mix a heavy milk uh, chocolate, something such as uh, maybe a 40 or 45% milk chocolate. Then you mix it with what's called creme fraiche, which is about a 40% cream. Mm -hmm. And then you add in all the ice wine and whatever else together. Yeah. So it's a combination. If you do something like caramel and sea salt, you could bite the first half and only have caramel. And the second half, you might only get salt and you've thrown off the whole truffle. So you have to put the whole thing in your mouth. You can chew it. Chat room has just mentioned that Sasha actually did that wrong. She needs to try again. So mm. we're going to we're gonna <laughs> work on that a little bit later. Yeah. Thank you, Chat room. All the other viewers are going, oh, she needs to do that again. <laughs> try again. <laughs> and type my name. <laughs> well, it is such a pleasure having you here, Kevin. Uh, again, cat5.tv slash yum is where you want to go. Check it out, okay? And uh, make sure that you let them know that you heard of them here at Category 5 TV as well when you order. Uh, and don't forget to cast your ballot. Send me an email live at category5.tv. What does it mean? Thea Broma. You got it. Kevin, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Cheers. We'll uh, do the old switcheroo here. As, as uh, fun as that is, this is Category 5 Technology TV. And uh, this is episode number 281. You're safe to switch. You'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm happy. Leave those here. <laughs> Unless you have anybody cars. Oh yeah, we didn't. He, <laughs> he didn't ask me anything about e-commerce. He's he's actually doing a sales entirely through the website, um, or at least you can go to the website and actually order directly there. Um, we didn't get into that. You're right, but um, you can actually order directly off the website using uh, PayPal. And are there any other payment methods as well? Is it no, but strictly I'm PayPal right now? Through a thing called Beanstream. I'm looking at that. Looking at Beanstream as well. Banks, so. Yeah. <laughs> Just to throw me. Everybody, yeah, get on over there to his website and you'll be able to uh, place your order. Cheers. Wow. How is it? Okay. Really, really good. Isn't that amazing? Kevin, thank you. Okay. We need to get so, these. Show's over. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for the news? <clears throat> oh, yes. All right. Completely. <laughs> So, here are the top news stories from the Category 5 dot newsroom. Just a day after Canada pulled its penny from production, Amazon has announced they are introducing a new virtual currency called Amazon Coins. It's billed as an easy way for Kindle Fire customers to spend money on developers' apps in the Amazon App Store. The company will introduce the currency in May with tens of millions of dollars worth of free Amazon coins to spend on developers' apps. Amazon will also make it quick and easy for customers to buy the coins with their accounts. Developers, meanwhile, will make 70% on every purchase with the rest going to Amazon. Wow. So there we go. Um, next, a quarter of a million Twitter users have had their accounts compromised in the latest of a string of high-profile internet security breaches. Twitter's information security director, Bob Lord, said about 250,000 users' passwords had been stolen, as well as usernames, emails, and data. Yikes. Ouch. Affected users have had passwords invalidated and have been sent emails informing them. Mr. Lord said the attack was not the work of amateurs. He said it appeared similar to recent attacks on the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Wow. The U.S. newspapers reported that their computer systems had been breached by China-based hackers. Hmm. So there you go. I guess if it's happened to you, you already know. 
right? You would that's, have that's already the way been. It sounds, yeah, mm-hmm. that they've notified people and changed their passwords. Exactly. So at least they're proactive that way. I'd like to know why they're holding unencrypted passwords, though. I mean, re- technically, there should be no way for somebody to obtain passwords. That seems a little odd, but. Uh, it's maybe not the work of know. amateurs, so maybe not the work of not amateurs. the work of amateurs. Somehow they're able to reverse MD5 checksums with hashed and salt. <laughs> I don't somehow, know. Somehow, British engineering group Dyson has an un- unveiled a device that combines a high-speed hand dryer with hot and cold water outlets. The firm's mm. founder, Sir James Dyson, said that the device offered long-term savings over hot air dryers and towels. That is neat. However, one expert said it, its appeal might be limited until its cost fell. The airblade tap costs around 1,000 pounds. That's pounds, right? Yes. Yes. Hokey doodle. <laughs> the it mach- would take a long time that- to pay that off. Yeah. <laughs> to make it pay paper for Paper towels are not yeah. that expensive. 1,000 so. pounds worth Ouchie. of paper towels. The machine consists of a unit placed underneath the sink containing a motor, an air filter, and, and sound silencing equipment. A pipe that carries the water, electronics, and air to the tap, and a stainless steel head unit from which the water flows an unheated air jet water flows and unheated air jets out at four hundred and thirty miles per hour. Boy. <laughs> Infrared sensors detect where the user's hands are. If placed under the tap center, water comes out wait, if placed under the tap center, water comes out. If placed at its sides, the air nozzles air nozzles are triggered. Whoa. I feel it's like thing, it's a good thing you told us this because I'm looking at that and thinking if I ever saw that in a bathroom I would have no clue how to use it. So now we know. Air jets sides, out at 430, jets out, 430 miles an hour. Stick your gun you in there still? and then put your hands there. It will blow a hole through your hand. Be careful, folks. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> hmm. Okay. What's next? Sony. <laughs> next. Sony has announced it is to deliver its last mini disc stereo next month. It marks the end to the firm's support for the system, which it launched in 1992. Um, I hadn't heard about it, mind you. You haven't heard about mini I haven't discs. heard about it. Really? Heather's shaking her head. What is that blue thing? Uh, so, the format only ever had limited success outside of Japan and was ultimately doomed by the rise of recordable CDs and MP3 players. Right. That's the problem. I have not been to Japan. But we had them here in Canada, of course, and Heather's shaking her head. I can't tell if she's never heard of it or if she's just like, Sony, you blew this one. <laughs> but here's the thing. I mean, I had one of these. We all had one of these in radio because when we're doing interviews and things, when you're getting news bites and sound bites, what was neat about it, you, you've got this disc and you put it in this device and you plug a microphone into that device, which is the size of, you know, about three or four inches square, not cubed. It's very, very thin. And it would record in CD quality. So it's just a little tiny thing with a double, a AA battery and you could just go around doing interviews with this cheap little thing that's like 130 bucks. But it was a failed technology because nobody bought it. Oh. But I didn't realize they were still making it. You still have a month. <laughs> yes. So, hey, so, everybody, here's our have- last one. Go buy it now. It won't be supported a month from now. You won't be able to get any discs for it. Buy the discs? They said also. that they would be good for 30 years, and they're not. The discs apparently uh, can fail, just like CDs and, and floppy disks did. And hmm. So, disappointing, Sony. So Sad. I will reiterate what Heather said. <laughs> okay, next. All right. Architects Foster and Partners have revealed designs for a building on the moon that could be constructed nice. from materials already on its surface. There's basically da, a da, lumber da, da. mill. You can see the lumber mill over the... This, this is a big deal. An inflatable structure would be transported from Earth, then covered with a shell built by 3D printers. The printers, operated by robots, would use soil from the moon, known as regolith, possibly known as regolith, to build the layered cover. (laughs) That's actually the robot there. That was a person. (laughs) (laughs) The proposed site for the... The proposed site for the building is the southern pole of the moon. It is designed to house four people and can and could be extended. Studio. It's designed it to house. It would make a yeah. great studio. Although broadcasting Proposed fees are Proposed to house roof. four people. Our STL would be like millions. Wow. I wonder how many people want to move to the moon. It looks a little bit like an igloo. From It looks like we're kind of looking at it from the backside, and that's like the a, entrance over there by the, the android man. Like, like a geodome, like those house structures that you see that are like 
earthquake proof, yeah. right? Kind of, yeah. I or think what's, what's neat about proof. the idea, and, and it sounds like they're actually going forward with this particular one, of course, like 3D printers are, are it's a, astounding, the things that we were talking about, chocolate. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about it on the last time you were here, 3D printed chocolate. I get all the chocolate shows. <laughs> we, we do love <laughs> chocolate. Uh, but here is an opportunity for them to just send a little bit of stuff to the moon refine the stuff that's on the surface of the moon right there while they're there using the regolith yeah yeah. (laughs) the regolith um (laughs) it's crazy the company has already begun developing the needed printer and hopes to be ready to start production by 2020 amazing get the full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom the category 5.tv newsroom is researched by roy w nash with contributions by our community of viewers if you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention email newsroom at category 5.tv for the category 5.tv newsroom i'm sasha dermatis thanks sasha tonight's show is brought to you in part by quartery electric if you need any electrical work done in uh, in central ontario give them a call it's quarteryelectric.com for all their info. Also, get your free trial of Netflix. It's a full month's trial. Gives you enough time to watch several movies and get into some shows. Really get a feel for how Netflix works and see if you love it. Cat5.tv slash Netflix. I heard, I heard a voice that I didn't know had come in. Is there somebody extra here? Rachel Shu is here uh, joining us. I don't know if you can wave to those on Backstage Pass, but say hi. Did, uh, did Rachel Shu get to try one of those chocolate <gasps> truffles? Because oh. that needs to be arranged. Here we go. Oh, if we, a Theobroma chocolate truffle. Mm. There we are. Thank you. Fantastic. Yummy. Um, it's good to see I you. I probably need more you of need that more? chocolate. They're here somewhere. <laughs> Here you go. Um, While Robbie's talking. Robbie, why don't you talk yes. about backups um, and why you can't trust... I was talking to you just before the show and, and thinking about... I was just talking about the, the mini the right. mini discs that they had, Sony had. And the problem with them is that they're not reliable. And, and the truth is also there for CDs. Have you ever backed up anything to CD or DVD? No. You haven't? No. Oh, you, <laughs> with the, from the smirk, she's like, I've never backed up a thing. <laughs> We talked about backing up, remember? On like my second show. Eh? No, I stopped turning my computer on. I actually haven't that turned was your my safety mechanism. I haven't turned my computer on. Well, if on. I don't turn it on, it can't possibly crash. <laughs> this is why I watch Category Five on my phone. Well, I've mentioned it before that that CDs, DVDs, rewritable media. It's not a reliable. You really want me to change camera angles here, don't you? She's holding the truffle to her mouth and the. Like, oh, he's Robbie talking to me. Robbie is talking to me. Folks at home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the CDs, DVDs, flash media, it's not a reliable medium in order to do your backups. I mean, I have i have burnt stuff to DVDs and then come back to them two years later and they don't work. Um, and that's because of the, the way that CDs, DVDs actually hold the data. You think that it's a permanent storage mechanism, but it's actually not because it's so susceptible to, uh, to heat and cold and fluctuations in temperature that way. Uh, to uh, movement and light and things like that. So, so just to demonstrate that, I actually um, actually took a CD and I did this as a little bit of an experiment. And I created a CD in 2006, and I labeled it here as such that I actually did this in 2006, and I burnt it to a Maxell D- uh, CDR, and you know as good as any CDR is, that's what they are. And then here we are in 2013. And I ran a test. So here, we, you know, it's, it's seven, eight years later kind of thing. And you'd expect that that stuff is okay. But if you're backing up, usually when someone backs up something to CD, DVD, they're thinking, these are family photos that I want to clear off space on my computer. So I'm going to burn them to DVD, and then I'm going to delete them and put the DVD in a safety deposit box. Little do you realize that seven years from now, you're probably not going to be able to read that stuff. Um, so I actually put that into my system in Linux, and I did uh, try to do a copy, a DD copy, just to show you what would happen. DD is a way to copy from a, a disk, and you'll see that continually, repeatedly, all that I got from that disk was input-output error, and as I f- scroll through the file, nothing but input-output error, 7.8 megs, 11 megs, and data corruption on that disk. Now, if I plug that disk into a Microsoft Windows computer, it simply would not read. If I plugged it into Linux, it would read, but then as I tried to access the files, it would crash. 
Um, so those kinds of mediums, don't trust them for your, your backups. If you're going to be saving some space on your computer, make sure you've got a, a reliable uh, type of backup, a hard drive with redundancy. So two hard drives are really, you know, and, and having multiple different types of ways of storing your data. So if I put something on a DVD, that's all fine and good. It may work seven years from now, but it may not. So I should really have it also on a hard drive on some other storage media as well. So, all right. If anybody has any questions in the chat room for us tonight, we'd love to uh, to have you message Sasha's uh, there. She's finished. Her if it's about chocolate, I am responding. Chocolate. Turns she, out. Yeah, it was very good. <laughs> like, it's what very, else do you want to know about the chocolate? <laughs> I'm going to fire up a virtual machine here, and tonight we're going to actually look at some very basic uh, internet usage. And the reason that I wanted to do that tonight is because we have so many people who, you know, we've got such an eclectic mix of viewers. We've got those of you who are quite well versed at using the computer, and you know, you're you're using Linux and you're you're hacking away and you're and you're learning your way around and doing very very well that way. And then we actually have people who have never used a computer before, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. who come to us and say, okay, well, I just bought my first laptop. And honestly, it took me by surprise the first time that happened because it's like, seriously? Like, this is 2011, 2012, 2013, and you've never used a computer before in your life. Granted, usually se seniors, mm -hmm. right? like people who uh, yeah. you know grew up in a t completely different generation have never used a computer because it's never been a part of their lifestyle and, and, and the way that their society grew up. Mm -hmm. So, admittedly, that's that's usually who we're talking about. So, when you go into a store and you buy a computer, typically, what does it come with? Unfortunately, it doesn't come with Linux. Right, it comes with Windows. Windows 7 at this point, and progressively we're going to start mm -hmm. seeing Windows 8 more and more. So, I'm going to actually log into Windows 7 so that you can see what this looks like. And I've taken the liberty of just installing a few different browsers here. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with how the internet works. And tonight we're just going to take a real quick look at the very most basics of internet usage. And I would encourage you to email us live at category5.tv with your questions. If you're new to the internet, if you ever find that you're just overwhelmed, I mean, there's even that case where you're just trying to use your computer and you're not too sure how it works. And so you click on the wrong thing and all of a sudden it's, you know, something else is gone or you can't find your email or you can't find this or that. I know that it's a case, you know, with multitasking where, you know, if I bring up a browser and it covers my screen, well, how do I get back to the other, uh, the other window? So we're going to really simplify for you and make it uh, easy for you to understand and hopefully be able to help you to understand how your computer works a little better. And we're going to be doing that through the course of this series, which we're starting tonight. So, so I've actually taken the liberty of installing three what are called web browsers. And we should understand what the Internet is. And, and the Internet is not Internet Explorer. The internet is not Chrome or Firefox. The internet is, is an actual way that many, many computers communicate together. So think of it, you know, it used to be called the, the information superhighway, right? Uh, you don't really hear that too much mm -hmm. anymore. But it's a good comparison where World the internet is really this, this massive freeway of, of roads that are interconnected. And, and if you follow the right road, you end up at the right place. But whether you're driving a Toyota or whether you're driving, you know, a, a Chevrolet, it doesn't really make a difference to your use of the internet or the highway. Mm -hmm. So if I'm using Linux or Windows or if I'm using Firefox or Internet Explorer, those things are not the internet. The internet is the communication between all of these different computers. So, so when somebody says, okay, well, bring up your, your web browser, what they're talking about is bringing up Internet Explorer or Mozilla Firefox or Google Chrome, depending on what you use. Now, because we're on a Windows 7 computer, which comes with Internet Explorer, we're going to pretend, you know, most likely that is on your system. Somebody who cares about you may have installed something better, <laughs> but Internet Explorer is definitely going to be a part of your system if you're using Windows. So when I click on that, it's a little bit overwhelming because out of the box, it's got all this stuff. I mean, I've got credit card advertising. I've got all these kind of... You know, it doesn't look very... It's a little overwhelming. It's busy. It's busy. It's busy. It's Sometimes it's offensive. It and and it's it's <laughs> not, you know, it's just, okay, well, what do I do now? If okay. you were new to computers, it would be immediately overwhelming. Well, now I'm on the internet, right? 
I, I clicked on Internet or Internet Explorer, so now what do I do? And somebody tells me, okay, well now I want you to go to Category5.tv because that's this great TV show that's going to help you to understand how to use your computer. So, okay, well it's flashing here, so I'm probably going to put in Category5.tv as they said. And then what do I do? I'll probably, you know, hit enter. And where does that take me? Well, I thought it was supposed to take me to category5.tv, but it didn't. It gave me instead a, a list of a whole bunch of things. What this is, is this is not actually our website. This is, this is called a web search. So when I typed it in here, I wasn't actually going to our website. I was just doing a search. When somebody s says to go to a website, if it's google.ca or if it's category5.tv, they're talking about this address bar, which is up at the very, very top. usually starts with HTTP, which is the protocol. It doesn't really matter to you. But it always has a website address. And you can change that to take you directly to wherever you want to go. Now, it's okay to do a search because if I know what I'm searching for, I've done a search for category5.tv and luckily my website, the, the television show, comes up first and so you're safe to click on that and it will get you there. But th the thing is, is what's the next one? The next one is about a, a large format digital printer. The next one is a hurricane shutter system. So if for the moon. we're unfortunate and it doesn't lead us to the right place, we could end up somewhere absolutely off from where we wanted to end up mm -hmm. and then it, it can become overwhelming because the internet is a huge place. <coughs> there are 82,500 results when I did a search for category5.tv so that oh, yeah. can be very very overwhelming. So instead it's good to use the address bar and I'm going to show you how to do that. So up at the very very top here of your web browser, we're using Internet Explorer right now, I can if I click once, it's going to all be highlighted. If I accidentally click a second time, then when I start typing, it's actually going to go in and leave all the other stuff. So I can actually highlight this whole thing, or an easy way is to click three times really, really fast. So watch what I do. Click, 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 and it highlighted everything. Okay. So now I can type category5.tv into that area, hit enter, and it instantly takes us to, to the television uh, website for category5.tv. Similarly, if that was Google and you wanted to get to Google, you would type in google.ca if you're in Canada, and it gets you there. And that is another search engine. Okay, So that's Internet Explorer. Let's see what it looks like somewhere else. Let's go into Mozilla Firefox. So this is a different browser. Again, we're not changing the Internet. We're just using a different program to access it. And you'll see that it's pretty similar. It doesn't have the same clutter but it does have an address bar which we've just learned about and it has a search. So if I search I'm going to get a similar kind of result as to what I had on Internet Explorer. It's going to give me a list. And fortunately again we're the first one in the list so we will end up at the right place if I click on it. But the other concern is is that if somebody malicious came up in that list and they were pretending to be category5.tv you might accidentally click on that and get into the wrong place and provide some kind of information to them that you don't want to provide. So again, we're going to use the address bar up at the top, category5.tv, hit enter, and it takes us immediately there. There it goes. So that's Firefox. Google Chrome is another popular browser. We're just looking at three tonight. And you'll see right off the bat, there's a search, and there is an address bar up at the top. If you have multiple of these kind of areas up at the top, like Firefox, for example, has an address bar at the left and a search bar at the right. The one that you want to use for your addresses is the one that says go to a website or it may have an address already there. If you're on Google, for, for example, it will say www.google.ca. So to use a search effectively, so for many of those browsers, now that we know the difference between the address bar at the top and the search, which is usually a part of the website that we're looking at, this is Google, um, or some browsers, as you see up at the top right of your screen there, have a search built into the browser at the top. With the search, this is, this is a little bit different because we're not going to actually type in a website address. When you have somebody's business card, you know, it has their website address. It'll say www.mybusiness.com, whatever it happens to be, and that will take you right there if you put it into the address bar. On the other hand, if you don't know the website address, that's when you want to use the search. search. So this is where we would say, 
Okay. I don't know the name of this television show, but I've heard that there is a show called Category 5. I started typing and it already started doing it. Space. And, oh, look, it's already given me the name. Technology TV. And if I hit enter, then I can see the results. And it gives me, oh, okay, well, there's the address. It is actually Category5.tv. Or similarly, now let's, let's make it even tougher for the search engine. Let's do a technology TV. Let's just search for that. And this will, now we happen to be number one for that result as well. <laughs> but let's see if we can get a good example. We'll do tech TV. So then we're competing against tech TV, the old uh, network television channel. So then you see we're actually at the bottom of the page. So if you clicked on the first result, we would be you'd be in the wrong place. This isn't us at all. This is a, a Wikipedia article. It's like an encyclopedia on the internet that tells us about this tech TV um, television channel. So then I need to scroll down on my search results and I need to find out which one is the right one and I realize, okay, well this is the one because this one says free tech TV broadcasting featuring broadcast featuring Linux, open source, cool gadgets, and more. So I know, oh, okay, well, this is the one I was looking for when I did a search simply for tech TV, and I click on it. So if you're searching for a company, you can search for the company's name. You can search for uh, keywords, which are, you know, things that the, there we used uh, keywords, tech TV, mm -hmm. um, things that it's about, and you might be able to find it on the list. You may have to go to the next page, next page. We happen to be on the front page, but that's that's because we do quite well in the search engines. But so with the website address, though, when you have that, you can actually get right there direct. using the address bar. Mm -hmm. Direct link. Is there? I guess there's pros and cons of each one. I'm seeing in the chat room there are people who uh, prefer Chrome versus for the Firefox. for the different browsers. Yeah, and yeah. we're we're keeping things pretty simple tonight. Uh, for those of you who you know that we we really want to help you to understand the differences uh, between where the address bar is and the search bar, and and really get into the basics, the fundamental uh, how to use the internet. Mm -hmm. It's very important that you understand this because I want to I want you to find your way around and, and be able to find what you're looking for on the internet and actually get to where you want to go. Uh, so then, getting a little bit more technical. Yeah, there there will be uh, you know many different people will say well Chrome is better than Internet Explorer. They will say Mozilla Firefox is better than Internet Explorer. They will say that a bag of flaming poop is better <laughs> than Internet Explorer. They will say that. There, there you go. That's sort of what's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we have it. <laughs> then you're just getting into yeah. Those are the different features, and that's why I say if if somebody loves you and, and cares for you and is going to take good care of you, they'll put something else on there for you. Internet Explorer is uh, is probably the most dangerous internet browser to use as far as like getting online and and surfing around. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to be really really careful. And if you accidentally click on the wrong site, boom! All of a sudden you're you're infected and somebody's got your credit card information and it's it's scary stuff. Aye. Which takes me to the next discussion that I wanted to have with you, which which kind of involves what's called phishing scams. Have you ever heard of that? I have heard of that. Yes. You go fishing. No. Yes. I I got I've got several emails. Some of them angry. Some of them kind of nice, saying you can't get phishing scams on Linux. You can't get fished. Mm-hmm. That's that's what I have have heard from many many people, and and unfortunately that that symbolizes a, a misunderstanding of what phishing really is and you know I'll, I'll keep this simple as well for you a phishing scam what it is is somebody who tricks you into giving them their information if I had a perfect Robbie costume mm -hmm. and I came up to you and I said I'm Robbie can I borrow five bucks you'd mm -hmm. probably loan me five bucks because I'm Robbie you recognize me and you know who <laughs> I am you know I'm good for it right, right? I tricked you because I'm not Robbie at all. I am Alon Sakihana, right? So, <laughs> if you get the reference, then I love you. The, that's what phishing is. Somebody who tricks you. I got a letter today. This isn't on the computer. Okay. So do I need to have Windows in order to be susceptible to this? No. Not at all. This is a letter that you came in the mail. Phishing letter? I got a phishing letter. Let's open it up. We had uh, we did an interview with a guy who was talking about phishing scams mm -hmm. on Facebook and and that sort of opening that. Brilliant! Look at how professional this looks. This looks 
really serious stuff. It looks government. It's even got fine print on the back. What does it tell me? My domain, baldnerd.com, is due for renewal. Of course it is. Yes, I know it is. It's February 25th. As a courtesy to domain name holders, we are sending you this notification of the domain name registry that is due to expire in the next few months. When you switch today, and it goes on, and it gives me the pricing. Pricing to renew my domain is $40 for one year, $70 for two, or $160 for five years, which it lists as the best value. So me, I, okay, I've got a domain, and this is just an example. This is a letter that I received today. This looks entirely legit. How? It has a spot for me to fill out. I know that I, okay, I need to renew my do domain. You, how do you know that it's not legit? Because I know. And now you know. This is the Domain Registry of Canada. They are scammers. So watch out for this if you own a domain and, uh, and ever receive this. This is a phishing scam, a classic mail phishing scam. They even give me a return envelope so that I can make it real easy. So what am I going to do? Oh, well, yeah, I've got this domain. Oh, they're going to give it to me for $160 for five years. That's a fantastic deal. So I'm going to fill in my credit card information. That's what it's asking for. I'm going to put in my total amount, which is 160. I'm going to put it in the self-addressed envelope that they gave me. Notice that I am not on Windows, and I just sent them my credit card information, which they now own my domain, and I've lost it. So they can turn it into a search engine or porn site or whatever they want to do. It's not mine. So that... I, I, hope, I can't easy. stress enough. It's easy to be scammed then. It is Completely. very easy because things look real. Yeah. That's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're on Windows. It doesn't matter if you're on Linux or Mac. They look real because these people are professional. I was on Facebook and I saw this message in, in one of my friend's timelines and it said, I saw you in this video on Facebook. Who posted this of you? Skip to video, uh, skip the video to 144, type in with no spaces and search for your name on, and it has a URL but it's not clickable. You have to actually type that in on your computer. So the person thinks nothing of it and they actually type it into their computer. But when they do that, it, it redirects them and it looks exactly like, well, it's Facebook. But what happens when you click on a link that requires you to log into Facebook, what's the first thing that you do? You log into Facebook. Because something about that link, you're used to it, mm -hmm. requires you to be logged into your Facebook account. Mm -hmm. Right? It's password protected. So what do I do? Without thinking about it, I enter my Facebook credentials and I hit log in. But it fails. Well, why did it fail? I entered my right username and password. Well, what's actually happening there is it's sending your username and password to the fisher. The hacker, if you will. They're uh, collecting that information. How do I know this? Look at the I'm URL. Right. Remember we learned about the address bar? So the address bar also serves to protect us. So do I need to be on Windows to accidentally give my Facebook username and password to somebody? No. This is Linux, Mac, my iPhone, my Android device. doesn't matter what you're using. You're still susceptible. That's mm -hmm. phishing, and that's what's so scary about phishing because a virus scanner won't stop you from getting that kind of stuff. A virus scanner won't stop this from coming in the mail. It takes knowing and being very, very cautious about what, what you fall for and, and what you follow up with. And that's you know, one of the reasons that the show is here, too. Mm -hmm. If you ever doubt, if you ever get something and you're not sure, send us an email, live at category5.tv. Forward it over to us, and we'd be happy to take a look at, at it for you and, uh, and find out if it's, if it's real. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Oh. That's oh, yeah. literally, I mean, it's hard to believe that that's all the time that we had tonight. But uh, any questions quickly in the chat room for us? Um, yes. Um, do we ship, or did Kevin, just Kevin, not we, ship internationally? That was a major question in the chat room. Yes. Absolutely. All right. There you go. So don't forget, you can win a box as well. Cat5.tv slash yum. Find out what theobroma means and email live at category5.tv. But definitely, I mean, with Valentine's being so close, don't wait for the for the freebie that might be coming your way because you're one in, in 60,000 people. But make sure that you are one of the people that go to the website and actually make a purchase today. So thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, good chocolate. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anytime. We're running low. Yeah, yeah. We, have have, yeah. we, yeah. we, have, we know people who know people. Excellent. So, Kevin, thank you very much for being here. Heather, Rachel, wave to the cameras and. Everybody have a, a fantastic week, and uh, of course, we'll be back next week with you. Excellent. And make sure you check out our website, www.category5.tv. Hope you had fun tonight. Sasha, always great to have you. And, nice to be uh, nice here. To see you. Yes. Take All care, right. Everybody. Bye. See ya. Enjoy the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local show times in your area at category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.